Okay, so it's time. Let's let's get started. Um, this is an important day for everybody here. So because we have Professor Park Patak, right? Uh, okay, so let me introduce him uh, just a little bit. So Professor Park Patak is professor of economics at MIT. Uh, he received PhD at Harvard in 2007. Uh, he served as a junior fellow at Harvard then, and then moved uh, to MIT where he is right now. Okay. Um, there are too many uh, honors and awards to this list over here. Uh, so let me just list a few. So um, as I mentioned, he was a prestigious Harvard Junior Fellow uh, before joining MIT, and, and uh, he was an NSFJ award. And then he was the um, John Bates Clark Medal, uh, also known as the Baby Medal. So he has, well, a work, uh, very significant ones uh, in many fields, but especially in the theory and ethics in market design, and uh, uh, especially in the education field. So I worked with Prag uh, on two papers uh, in market theory. And I learned a lot of things from him. And one of the things that I admire about him most is that he has such great angle to ask the right question. And, and he also has a really wide knowledge in and out of economics. And let me just talk about a uh, few things. So well, somehow I still remember uh, that time. Um, <laughs> In 2015, um, both Prague and I were in Montreal uh, for a conference uh, where we were presenting. And I was expecting my first child uh, back then. Uh, and he had, I think, maybe three year old son. And so he was a little bit ahead of me. And as, as someone, he knows, knows a lot about education and everything. So I was asking about how to prepare for the newborn baby. And I asked a lot about the daycares and schools and so on. And then I asked about the editor uh, whether we should do the breastfeeding or we should use a phone now. Uh, right? So that's sort of like coming to mind when you're preparing for baby. So he was actually, surprisingly, he actually gave me a lecture. So he was saying, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there's no, no good evidence uh, coming, you know, not the standard for for us. And then he actually he mentioned some of the uh, best research that he he is aware of, and uh, that was very helpful. I was I was really admiring him uh, since then. Um, so now I think almost ten years have passed since that conversation, and I'm really happy to get updated on the, uh, my child education. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So please go ahead. I'm very happy to have you. Well, it's great to be here. Um, I was um, initially scheduled to come uh, here in May of 2020, so it's been a long time coming. Um, uh, but we didn't mention that we know each other for uh, more than 20 years, actually. So the office next to me in Battle School taught me a lot of uh, things. And um, uh, so it's really, it's really great to see the center here and be here in Tokyo talking to all of you today. Um, so I have uh, prepared a set of lectures on um, uh, a set of papers that I've been working on for the last several years, um, where um, <clears throat> we're trying to understand uh, how to use market design algorithms as part of uh, evaluation of uh, uh, the effect of getting uh, a certain assignment. And so this is what we call research design means market design, or we often <laughs> do it the other way around, market design means research design. but. Uh, you know, when Fujito and I were students years ago, two decades ago, uh, it was a very exciting time because uh, market design algorithms were being uh, studied and proposed and actually implemented in the field in uh, numerous uh, settings. And most of the work that we were uh, focused on at that time was thinking about the allocated properties of different uh, assignment protocols. Uh, is this uh, system have good incentives? Is it fair? Uh, is the allocation efficient? And uh, it was particularly exciting because the uh, abstract theoretical ideas were being discussed in uh, major public policy decisions and new, new systems were being um, uh, implemented in the field. Uh, so uh, one of the things that I've been working on since then is uh, understanding whether uh, the fact that we have a centralized allocation system, centralized algorithm, can be used to actually uh, study the effect of getting a certain assignment. It doesn't really matter if you got your first choice or not. 
Um, now, based on your choice, surely uh, you'd be happier if you got your first choice and a, a lower rank choice. But what about uh, in terms of the downstream consequences of getting that choice? Are you learning more, for instance, for uh, by virtue of going to your first choice school? Um, and one of the in interesting ideas is that uh, when you have a centralized uh, resource allocation algorithm, uh, you have full knowledge on the process of why someone got allocated what they got, okay? Uh, and that uh, knowledge can be used to um, construct research designs uh, that uh, provide very rigorous answers to questions about what was the effect of getting a, a certain assignment. Okay, so this is the broad set of questions I've been thinking about for, for uh, about a decade now. And so my plan for the lectures today, I'm going to uh, set the table and give you a little bit of background. I'm going to spend most of my time talking about uh, this paper from a couple years ago. Um, that really is the, the origin of this agenda. Um, and uh, at the latter half of my talk today, I will talk about an application of this paper to the question of universal preschool. Okay, so it's a, a pretty applied question uh, where we look at the long run effects of going to universal preschool. Um, the next lecture is going to talk about uh, extending some of these ideas to a situation where the assignment algorithm is doing tie breaking but not using lotteries. Uh, they're using um, what we call non lottery tie breaking. Uh, and here I'm going to talk uh, a bit about an application looking at the importance of match effects. Okay, so does it really matter that a particular child gets to attend a particular school? Um, or is the um, schooling process in the United States more vertical? Okay, there's some good schools and there, there's some bad schools. Who gets to go to the good schools doesn't matter. Everyone would benefit the same amount by going to the good school. Um, and then uh, I'm going to turn uh, in my last lecture to some applications of these ideas. So um, one thing that's happened this year, in fact, in this morning's uh, Boston Globe in Boston, the main newspaper, there was a big uh, spotlight article about the 50th anniversary of court-ordered busing in the city of Boston. So some of you have surely heard of the Boston mechanism in uh, Boston, uh, the famous assignment mechanism. But the reason the city was using the Boston mechanism is because the courts came in in 1974 and mandated who got to go where uh, in an effort to try to increase integration across uh, the schools in Boston. And so we have a paper trying to ask whether the system is working as intended and whether busing from 50 years ago uh, which aspire to integrate schools and increase educational opportunity is, is doing that. Okay. Uh, and then uh, the last thing I want to talk about is um, uh, another paper that I've been working on um, that's called Who Gets What May Not Matter. Uh, and it's a deeper dive at, at looking at school match effects. Okay, so that's my agenda for the lectures. Um, please stop me at any time if you have any questions about anything. Okay, so uh, uh, it's great to make this as interactive as possible. I'll mention, you know, two of these papers are with my student, who also was a student here, Yusuke Narita. I think he visits here occasionally, but um, from what I gather, he's quite prominent in Japan. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but I don't have to explain that to me, because I learned that myself in the newspaper. Um, great. Okay, so let me, uh, let me jump into it, okay, and um, uh, set the stage a bit. So I know this is a review for many of you guys, but in many large uh, urban school districts, in the United States and in other parts of the world, uh, parents have the opportunity to choose schools from a menu of options, and they express uh, uh, strict preferences by ranking schools on this menu. And uh, on the school side, schools establish course priorities over applicants. Uh, there's a multitude of factors that can determine priorities, things like whether you live in the neighborhood uh, around the school or whether your older sibling attends the school, some districts use indicators for poverty status, like whether you're eligible for a subsidized school meal. And many cities in the US and elsewhere uh, convert the preferences and priorities into assignments uh, using variants of Gale and Shapley's deferred acceptance algorithm. Okay. Uh, so this celebrated idea in, in market design. And in, embedded inside of these uh, uh, implementations of deferred acceptance is the uh, uh, fact that some applicants are in the same priority group, so they need to have a way to break the tie among, say, applicants who are both applying from the same neighborhood or have uh, sibling status at the school. And it's very common that tie breaking is done by a randomly assigned lottery number. Okay. Um, 
Uh, so that's what I'm going to call lottery based tie breaking. Uh, in other cases, uh, there are tiebreakers that are based on other criteria like your test score performance, uh, your grades, um, other standardized assessments. That's what I'll call non lottery tiebreaking. Okay, so, to really understand the non lottery case, we need to first understand the lottery case. Okay, so that's what I'm looking for. Okay, and the applications are going to be using uh, both, both aspects here. Okay, and uh, an extensive literature. Uh, Examines the, the theoretical properties of uh, deferred acceptance. I think I'm, I once said it, and it's quoted in the New York Times after Al Ross won the Nobel Prize that deferred acceptance is one of the 10 greatest ideas in economics. <laughs> and I still believe that, actually. <laughs> uh, great. Okay. So we've done a lot to understand the theoretical properties of deferred acceptance. Um, and um, what I want to now turn to is using this as an evaluation tool or an experiment generator. So um, Deferred acceptance uh, and other allocation mechanisms satisfy what you know we call the equal treatment of equals property in uh, axiomatic resource allocation. Um, that's the idea that um, uh, if you have two applicants who are equals, they have the same preferences and priorities. Okay, and by that I'll refer to an applicant's type. Uh, then an assignment mechanism satisfies the equal treatment of equals property if it generates the same probability distribution over assignment. Okay, so this is a philosophical idea. I think it actually dates to Aristotle, right? Um, Shapley uh, used this uh, in his work on the Shapley value, but we see this often when we have mechanisms that, that have a stochastic component. Uh, so what this means is if I have two applicants who have the same exact type, um, and I look at the uh, outcomes of the assignment mechanism, I have a stratified randomized trial, okay? In the simplest case, if there's just one school okay, and there's no priorities, uh, everyone who's uh, interested in that school is just going to rank that school first. We have a simple lottery, right? Um, and uh, everyone would be treated equally in simple lottery case. Um, but uh, more generally, we have a stratified lottery here. What are the strata here? The strata are the preferences of the applicants. Okay, if I rank a different set of schools than you have, then uh, I'm going to be in a different strata potentially, and the priorities that the applicants have at the choices that they've ranked. Okay. So the question I want to turn to now is how best should we use the uh, uh, research designs embedded in the deferred acceptance algorithms? Okay. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to show you this to, uh, in the context of two uh, specific applications. So the first paper uh, is doing a study of a particular type of school in the United States, it's called a charter school. Okay, so charter schools are a very interesting model in the US because I think the main reason is they are uh, schools that are typically outside of the teachers union, they're outside of the collective bargaining agreement. Okay, so it's a, an innovative new education model in the US that um, many people are interested in understanding what's the effect of going to a charter school. And then uh, we'll talk also about the long term effects of preschool in Boston. Okay. So our, our goal is going to be to take these algorithmically generated offers of seats at schools and uh, use that to construct estimates uh, um, uh, of school effects um, that are, are going to exploit this stratified randomized trial. Okay. okay, so what does this last bullet point mean? So I have the offer process from the assignment algorithm. Uh, I'm going to convert that into a research strategy that allows me to look at the effect of enrolling at a charter school or enrolling in universal preschool. And so I'm going to do that using an instrumental variable strategy. Okay, but at the core is this random offer generating process. Yeah, I wish you can. Um, so at the, at the moment, but I, uh, I have a very sort of question. So uh, is your uh, analysis sort of split the BA or what happens if you use different variables? Yeah. Um, it's a great question. So um, what I'm going to talk about today is going to be in uh, what we call the DA class of mechanisms. So Boston would be in the DA class of mechanisms. Basically mechanisms that we can rewrite as DA. Uh, and um, we have a formal definition of that in the paper. Um, but intuitively, like top trading cycles is very difficult to write as DA unless you just basically take the top trading cycles assignment and kind of invert it. So that's not in the DA class, uh, but the Boston mechanism is in that class, as are you know things like the Taiwan mechanism or um, variants of the kind of cumulative offer idea. 
Uh, something that's not uh, have, hasn't been figured out actually is what I'm going to talk about here for uh, trading cycles. That's an open question actually. How to do this for trading cycles? Um, it, many other resources are allocated to linear programming mechanisms, uh, so that's not in the DA class. So that's also an open question. Um, I have a graduate student working on that that issue, and it, it's not an easy uh, uh, easy question actually. So. I'll, tu I'll turn to that at the end. Uh, if we have just some of the open open threads here. I think. Okay, perfect. Okay, so let me just kind of define the problem. So where I'm headed now is I'm going to introduce a little bit of notation, okay? I'm going to try to explain what the key thing we're trying to capture is, okay? And then explain how we're going to uh, give you a formula which captures um, uh, what we call the propensity score. That's a conditional probability of being assigned a choice. Um, based on uh, your type, right? Um, so um, let's uh, jump right into it. Okay, so the deferred acceptance, uh, again, apologies, I think many of you know this here. Uh, how does this work, right? So each student applies to their most preferred school. Each school will rank its uh, initial applicants uh, by priority and then by lottery number within priority groups, tentatively admitting the highest ranked applicants up to its capacity. Uh, the other applicants are rejected. Uh, uh, each rejected student will apply to their next most preferred school. Each school will rank these two applicants together with applicants tentatively admitted in the previous round, uh, first by priority and then by lottery number. And from this pool, the school will ten again tentatively admit those it's ranked highest up to capacity rejecting the rest. Okay, so deferring the acceptance. And the algorithm terminates when there are no new applicants, uh, applications, or each applicant has exhausted the schools uh, he or she has ranked. Okay, so uh, that's the market design piece. Now, the research design piece, this is where I will introduce some notation. Okay, so uh, let's let D uh, sub I of S uh, indicate whether student I is offered a seat at school S. Okay, so I'm headed towards asking a question about a collection of schools. What's the effect of going to a charter school or getting an offer uh, at preschool? But I'm going to build everything up from thinking about a single school. Okay, um, now, uh, in our deferred acceptance assignment system, applicants are characterized by their preferences, their rankings over schools, and their priorities. Uh, so we'll denote that their, by their type or theta. And uh, the concern that we have is that type affects your assignment. Right? If I rank a school higher, maybe I'm more likely to be assigned at school. Um, and so, so therefore, it's correlated with your outcome. Right, what I'm going to get after I get assigned to that school, how much I'm going to learn, what my test performance is, so on and so forth. So uh, type is a powerful source of omitted variables bias. Okay, so if I just were to do a comparison of students who are enrolled at a given school S to those who are not, and I haven't somehow controlled for their type, then I'd be worried that uh, my control, my, my comparison is biased. Um, uh, because I haven't adjusted for uh, differences between students appropriately. Okay. Now, uh, because of the equal treatment of equals property, as I just mentioned, the deferred acceptance algorithm creates this stratified randomized control trial. Okay. So, to be a little bit more precise about what I mean there, uh, let me define WI to be any random variable that's independent of lottery numbers. Okay. So, you can say that that's the applicant's race. Okay. Um, then it must be the case that the probability that kid I is assigned to school S given WI and theta is simply equal to the probability kid I is assigned to school S given theta. Okay, said, in, said another way, once I know what your theta is, any other variable like your race is irrelevant for determining your assignment probability, right? Because in deferred acceptance, the only thing that determines your assignment probability are these two objects, your preferences and your priorities, okay? So uh, it's very natural for us to think about WI as something that's a baseline characteristic, like your race or your prior test scores. Uh, it's also natural for us to think of WI in terms of your potential outcomes, okay? So this is uh, the idea of what you would learn if you were assigned uh, uh, an offer at a particular school or, or not, okay? So what's the upshot of this basic fact here? Okay, so 
uh, econometricians call this a conditional independence property, right? This is the exact same concept as the equal treatment of equals uh, property. Once I have uh, equal types, the thetas are the same, then it doesn't matter what your, your WIs are. The upshot of this is if I'm able to simply condition on your theta, I will have eliminated any omitted variables bias in, a, uh, uh, in comparison to the effect of attending, of getting an offer at a school. Um, uh, because the only thing that affects whether you got an offer at the school is what's encoded by theta. Okay. So uh, that's great. So if I were to say this in another way, more simply, I have a stratified randomized trial. What are my strata? The types. Your preference is cross priorities, right? Now, what's the problem with that? Well, preferences are a very coarse object. And uh, the priorities are also a very coarse object. So if I were to take my data set from a city, say, using deferred acceptance and tabulate applicants who have the same exact preferences and same exact priorities, uh, the number of applicants who uh, meet that test is going to be very, very small. Okay? Uh, in fact, in our setting in Denver, if I look at the applicants who ranked a charter school anywhere on their form, there's about 5,000 applicants who rank a charter school. And they represent about 4,200 different types. So what that would mean is if I look at my data set and say, let's find everyone who's got the same type, uh, there'll be many uh, cells in that data set where there's no comparison, just one kid with that type. Okay. So uh, conditioning on theta is going to be impractical. I'm going to need to try to find an alternative. Okay. Uh, and so that's what leads us to the propensity score. Okay. Now, I can tell you, when I was a student and I first learned about the propensity score, I learned about it in the concept of um, research where you do not have an experiment. Okay, so the propensity score is this very famous idea of Rosenbaum and Rubin uh, for settings where uh, it's an observational research design. There's no uh, a random occurring experiment. And we're actually going to be using the propensity score in a slightly different way. Uh, because we have an underlying experiment. So let me just now define what I mean by the propensity score. So the propensity score is simply the conditional probability of being assigned given your type. Okay, so it's just the uh, object here in the display here. P of uh, theta at school S is just the probability that an applicant of type theta is assigned school S. Okay. And what Rosenbaum and Rubin uh, established in 1983 is that the conditional independence property on the previous slide here implies that for any WI that's independent of lottery numbers, uh, the probability that applicant I is assigned school S given uh, their uh, variable WI and the propensity score is simply equal to the conditional probability that applicant I is assigned school S given their propensity score, which in turn is equal to the propensity score. Okay, so this looks deceptively simple. It indeed is almost trivial. Okay, it's like a three line uh, proof uh, of this result. Uh, but what's valuable about this result here is instead of conditioning on this high dimensional object theta, I'm now conditioning on this lower dimensional object, uh, a number between zero and one, it's a probability, uh, the propensity score, and I get the same uh, uh, elimination of omitted variables bias property. Okay. So why is this useful for us? Well, uh, the first thing is I would have already stated, instead of having to tabulate everyone with the same preferences and priorities, uh, I can instead tabulate individuals who have the same exact propensity score. Okay, those are gonna be the groups of individuals that compare to each other. Now, the score is going to identify the maximal set of applicants for whom we have a randomized school assignment experiment. Okay, so, if I'm interested in uh, school S, uh, if I had a way to characterize what P S of theta is uh, for all of the thetas, provided that that's between zero and one, provided that it's not degenerate, then there's someone who's facing risk of assignment to school uh, S. Um, and so uh, if I know what P S of theta is, I'll have the maximal set of applicants uh, for which we have an experiment. Um, the last thing is knowledge of the score is going to not only tell me who is subject to the experiment, but why they're subject to the experiment. Okay? And there's some somewhat counterintuitive things that emerge out of that that um, um, <clears throat> um, we didn't really understand very well until we had a, not more knowledge about the score. 
And this becomes particularly valuable in the non-modern case. Okay. Um, so what I'm headed to next is I'm going to show you two examples where I'm going to compute the score. Uh, there's simple enough examples where we can basically do this analytically, and it'll illustrate these two points. Uh, yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Um, so I guess uh, I, I think the problem would be how for us uh, this PS so because you actually need the same uh, PS frequency type. Correct. Um, so we just have some sense as the how how much bunching. Uh, yeah, how much uh, dimension reduction you get. Um, I'll show you some numbers on that. In you know in the Denver application, it's it's gigantic. Uh, lots lots of um, coordinates there. Um, um, one way that we're going to get uh, even more coordinates is where, where I'm uh, headed. I'm going to show you two examples. Okay, in a finite problem. Uh, I can characterize the score uh, if the problem is simple enough. Okay, uh, for any realistic problem, uh, it's impossible for me to give you this formula in a closed form. So we're going to then go to the continuum economy. Okay, uh, that's going to lead to further smoothing of this to uh, allow me to identify individuals that have the same problem. So that, that's another four separate index. Oh, right. yeah. Like, like my question about the meaning of this probability measure. Yeah. So all randomness comes from lottery. Correct. Oh, so the preferences and the priorities are fixed. Fixed, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, great. So, here we go. Okay, so let's go through an example. Uh, okay. Uh, the point of this example is to show you that the propensity score is going to pool together applicants of different types. Okay. Now, the simplest kind of story to tell you before even looking at these letters here is let's say Fujito and I are both applying to a given school, uh, let's say Harvard for our PhD. Okay. And my first choice is MIT, and my second choice is Harvard, and Fujito's first choice is Harvard. But what if MIT has a rule that says we are not going to admit anyone? from Harvard undergraduate to their PhD program. Okay, that's just the rule say. That's certainly not how it works, but um, what that means is the fact that I have listed MIT as my first choice is irrelevant for whether I get into Harvard for my PhD, right? Because their rule is you're not gonna get in under no circumstance, okay? Then if I looked at my data set and said, well, Fujito and I have different preferences, we couldn't be pulled together, right? We're in different types, right? But the propensity score, Fujito and I face, could be in fact the same um, because my first choice is irrelevant. And let's imagine when we apply, it's a, a coin flip. And fortunately, I was not in the same exact year as Fujito, so <laughs> that didn't actually happen. But uh, that's kind of what's going on here. Okay, there's a lot of information in the preferences that is irrelevant for determining your conditional probability of assignment. Okay. So let's let's see how that would work in a specific example. Okay, so the way to read this is we have five students, one, two, three, four, five, uh, and there's three schools, A, B, and C. Each school has one seat. Now you'll note here the first three students, they all want school A as their first choice, and students four and five want C as their first choice. There's only one seat at A, okay, so there's competition between these first three students. On the priority side here, we're going to assume that student two has priority at B and student five has priority at C. Okay, so now uh, let's think about student five. That student wants C and they have priority at C. Okay, so that's uh, uh, um, gonna essentially say no matter what the tiebreakers are in this problem, student five is gonna get school C. Given that, the fact that student four has rank C is irrelevant, right? There's no state of the world in which student four will get assigned school C. So what that means is our first four students are effectively all competing for A, and if we have an even lottery, they will get A uh, with an equal probability of one place. Okay. Um, so that's what the propensity score will teach us. If we just looked at the types, however, what we would notice is that um, uh, the types are unique. The only two students with some preferences are one and two, but student two is priority at B, <laughs> student one does not, but that's irrelevant information. That's what we're trying to uh, uh, use the propensity score to help us uh, ignore, okay? And indeed, what we see is that if we're interested in the effect of school A, uh, the propensity score will 
give us the answer. The deferred acceptance algorithm will assign the first four students to school A with a probability of one four. So it's showing you how we get cooling from the propensity score. Okay. Um, okay. So that's the first example. Uh, now let's look at the second example. So um, it's uh, the same kind of setup. We have four students now, uh, and there's three schools A, B, and C. Now there's no priorities here. Okay, so we can make this even simpler. And um, the student preferences uh, are as follows. So everyone has different preferences, so the types are unique. So no uh, full type conditioning research strategy. Um, and um, uh, let's try to figure out what the propensity score here is. Okay, so there's four students. So there's four factorial. There's 24 possible lottery draws of our students here, right? So one thing we could do is complete enumeration of those lottery draws. Okay. Yeah. You need it single tie breaking. Yeah. Yeah. And today I'm going to be focusing on single tie breaking. But back to your earlier question about what mechanisms are multiple tie breaking would be very easy. That that's kind of in the DA class. Okay, so um, what's going to be the probability that a student is assigned um, uh, school A? So you can just trust me on this. Okay, so there's 24 possibilities here. Um, you know, uh, student one is never going to be assigned school A. He doesn't rank school A, right? So that's why the probability that type one is assigned A is zero. Um, when would uh, student two, uh, a student of type two, be assigned? School A. Well, what has to happen? What has to happen is when a student two's chance to uh, uh, propose to a school, both C and B are taken by someone else. How could both C and B be taken by someone else? Well, it must be the case that one has come before two in the ordering, because one is going to take uh, C. Uh, and for B to be gone, it must be the case that three comes ahead of two uh, in the ordering. So the two orderings would be. One, three, two, uh, four. That's the first one. Or three, one, two, four. That's the second. Okay. So that's how we get two out of the 24 orderings or one twelfth of the time we have a student of type two being assigned uh, to school, school A, so on and so forth. Okay. Um, so what you see here is unfortunately, even though um, we have been able to compute the propensity score, uh, there's no pooling here. Okay, all four types have a distinct value of the propensity score, so no dimension reduction. Okay. Uh, so what do we do here? Well, let me show you something quite interesting. Okay. Um, now let me just make one more comment before I do that. So one of the things I'm hoping that you see when you think about your probability of being assigned to school A is that um, there's really two things going on. One is you have the opportunity to apply to school A. So our student of type two would only have the opportunity to, to apply to school A, he's rejected from C and he's rejected from B, okay? Uh, student of type three would only have the opportunity to apply to school A if he's been rejected from uh, school B, okay? So there's something interesting in this example. This is what we've cooked up to make it interesting that uh, type two and type three are both ranking B, okay? Their propensity scores in a finite problem are different. One is 112th, the other is 124th. But what's uh, very interesting is if I take this example and I scale it up, okay? So I take the continuum, the, the you know, type replication here, where I think of each of my four students as types and I have n types of student one, n types of student two, n types of student three, and, and likewise. Uh, and I let n also parameterize the number of seats in the uh, problem, um, uh, number of seats at each school, then, on a computer, if we enumerate what the propensity score is, so the way to read this is on the x-axis, this is the n, I'm scaling up my types, okay, the number of students of each type. On the y-axis, I have the probability of assignment to, to school A. What you see here is um, type two and type three scores converge to one another. And the n doesn't have to be that large, actually. So the difference in the, um, score is uh, gets quite small relatively quickly, okay? Um, and so uh, this is the point that I alluded to in, in response to Fujiko's earlier question. The second way that we're gonna get some pooling is by going to the continuum economy, okay? So what's the intuition? 
Uh, I will show you. So that, that's exactly where I'm headed. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the, the you know the quick answer just to not <laughs> keep you in suspense for too long is types two and types three both have rank B ahead of A. The fact that they rank B is going to determine their probability of getting uh, assigned to school A. And so the fact that type two is ranked C is going to be irrelevant. B is going to be what's the most informative information in their practice. And then that depends on how somehow C is taken by someone else. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Right. Okay. So so my agenda now, okay, so there's going to be a little bit more notation here. Okay. I mean, uh, apologize for that, but since so we spent years trying to make this as simple as possible, but I'm going to try to take your preferences and extract out the most valuable information in those preferences that will give me a formula for your propensity score. Okay. And what's going to be very important in your preferences is uh, what school did you not get into? And more importantly, what's the least selected? What's the easiest to get into school that you did not get into above your choice? Okay, so that's what we're going to call the most informative disqualification. Okay, mm -hmm. and so in this example, that's going to be school B for these two, two kids. I guess that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So uh, how, how easy is it to compute the approximate seed? Well, because you, you, you might need to have a lot of Yeah, yeah. yeah. In practice, right? Yeah. For, for this even. Right. Yeah, yeah. So to, when you had N, N is one, that's 24 lottery. <laughs> when N is two, right? It's, I guess, it's eight factorial, right? That's a big number. So uh, we, we don't exactly compute this. Uh, now, actually, I think uh, your paper with Mihai. Me, Tells us right that, um, or, or I'm sorry, with Yun Kuche tells us in this example, we can interpret uh, the limit behavior here as probabilistic serial, yeah. right? So I can tell you what happens at the end, right? Uh, now, what about in between um, um, this? We, we had to, I think we ended up doing this a million times, basically. Uh, any other questions about this? Okay, so. So these are two examples, kind of warm up examples. Now let's try to come up with a formula for the, the DA score and then we'll, we'll deploy that formula. Okay, so um, now this probability distribution. So to um, Michi's question, this is the permutation distribution because okay? so we're holding fixed the type and we're just redrawing lottery numbers. Um, and so the uh, <clears throat> uh, issue for us for Denver public schools, that would be 26,000 factorial lotteries. Now you could say the law of large numbers tells us it's enough just to sample those lotteries to do this, uh, say a million times. Uh, but the problem is that our covariates are discrete. So if I sample this uh, uh, many times, I still have to smooth the, the propensity score. Okay, so um, one, one way to think about the formula I'm gonna give you because I'm relying on the large market, basically I'm giving you an automatically smooth version of uh, this uh, simulated score. Now you could say, and we have seen people since our paper do this, they don't want to bother with computing the formula I'm going to show you. They just say, I have the algorithm, I'm going to simulate lottery draws a, a million times, tabulate the empirical frequency of the score, and proceed. Okay, and that's going to be okay uh, as long as your mechanism satisfies the equal treatment of equal. So for instance, if I had top trading cycles right now, and I wanted to understand what's the effect of getting a choice, that's what I would do, because we don't have a formula for that. Okay? Um, there's a couple of things that, that are unattractive about that. You still have to do some smoothing of what that, that is. Is a million enough? Is a half a million uh, sufficient? Um, the other thing is uh, um, the simulation is kind of a black box, okay? And so you don't really understand why uh, you have risk at a given school. Uh, so that I think is unattractive. The, the third thing I would say uh, where we're headed. So if I want to study the non-lottery case, um, uh, I can't do this in the non-lottery case. Okay, so that, that's kind of an open question as well. So if I have uh, a non-lottery tiebreaking setup and I wanted to use a computer to simulate the outcomes of the mechanism uh, and compute the propensity score for that problem, I don't know how to do that. Okay, here, because of the lottery case, we know the lottery distribution is the, you know, typically a uniform one if you do the simulation. Okay, so, uh, so just some comments on the lottery. So, um, uh, is there a formula? Now we've already seen that uh, you really need some special cases to get a closed form. Um, and so this is our motivation for going to this continuum model. Um, the DA uh, score, 
what we're going to call the DA propensity score, uh, will approximate the score as a function of a few easily computed sufficient statistics. One of the beautiful things about the continuum formulation of uh, the inverted acceptance algorithm is uh, we can represent outcomes in terms of cutoffs, right? The cutoffs associated with each of the schools. Um, and the formula for the propensity score that I'm going to give you is going to, is going to depend only on those cutoffs. Okay. Um, the second uh, thing is what I've already mentioned. So this is already smooth. The DA score is uh, automatically coarse, so there's no rounding or smoothing required. And then we'll see why, why we have the uh, randomized trial that we do. So, uh, so let's try to work towards this uh, formula. Um, so let me just kind of uh, define a couple of pieces of notation uh, before I give you the formula. Um, so I have uh, capital I students uh, with preferences and priorities. I'll just encode the priorities as integers. Okay, one through uh, K infinity will represent uh, being ineligible for a program. Uh, a student's type is a collection of their preferences and priorities. Um, and um, uh, row I will be the vector of student I's priorities, where row I S is your priority at school S. Uh, we have S, uh, capital S schools. Uh, lowercase s will be the indexing variable for the schools. The capacity vector uh, is given by Q. Um, in the continuum model, capital I will just be the interval from zero to one, and QS is the proportion of the interval that can be seeded at school S. Uh, student I's lottery number, RI, is going to be IID uniform 01. And let me introduce uh, the terminology of a rank. So a kid's rank at school S is just going to be the integer value of their priority, row IS, plus their lottery number, which I'm going to define to be between 0 and 1. Okay, so your rank, say, is 3.5. Okay, you're in the third priority group, and your lottery draw is a half. Now, the deferred acceptance assignment is characterized by a vector of cutoffs for each school. Uh, so an applicant to school S whose rank is below uh, the cutoff at school S and is higher uh, than the cutoff at school S tilde, where S tilde are all the schools that they prefer to school S. So you didn't get into a higher rank school. Uh, if that's the case, then you will be assigned to see at school S. Um, and the lottery numbers matter for assignments to school S only when they're in the marginal priority group. Okay, so what is the marginal priority group? It's easiest to just see this in a table, okay, the, the notation here. So here I have an example of a school, and I've sorted applicants to this school based on their rank. Okay, remember rank is priority plus a lottery number. So 1.13 is just 1 plus 0.13. And what we'll say here is, uh, the first four kids got an offer. The last four kids did not get an offer at the school. Okay. Um, so how would we define the cutoff at the school? We would say the cutoff is the rank of the last kid to get an offer at the school. Okay. Um, now, in general, it doesn't have to have this structure. You could have some zeros up here. How could you have a zero up here? Well, one of these kids could have gotten an offer at a higher rank choice. Okay. But uh, we're keeping it simple for now. Now, what's the marginal priority group? The marginal priority group is uh, um, the group for which there are some kids who got an offer and some kids who did not. So in this table, the marginal priority group is group number two. Another way to define it is it's the integer part of the cutoff, right? So cutoff is 2.35. That means the priority was two. That's the marginal uh, group. Anyone who is uh, in a lower priority group is going to get in for sure if they apply to the school. Anyone who's in a uh, worst priority group, a higher number priority group is never going to get in. Okay. Uh, okay, so the marginal priority group here we would say is priority group two. So that's uh, what row S is. And then the lottery cutoff is the cutoff that corresponds to the, uh, um, uh, like the, the, the cutoff for the marginal priority group. It's the decimal part of, of CS. Okay. So that, that's all my notation is doing. Okay, so that's the first uh, bit of notation. Now, let me introduce another bit, bit of notation. Um, so I am focusing on school S, so I need to think about the set of applicants who've listed school S on the preference form. So let's look capital theta of S denote the set of types uh, who rank school S. And um, 
I'm going to define capital B of theta S to be the set of schools that a type theta prefers to school S. You could say the better than set. Okay, these are the schools that uh, the applicant uh, type theta likes better than school S. Okay, so if S is my fifth choice, so the B of theta S would be choices one, two, three, four. Okay. So we can take the set of applicants who rank school S and partition them into three groups. Okay, so uh, the first is theta S N. Okay, so these are the group of applicants that we call the never seated applicants. Okay, so these are applicants whose priority at school S, rho of theta S, is greater than rho of S. Remember, rho of S is the marginal priority group. Okay, so in our picture here in the previous table, that would be these guys down here. These are the never seated group. Okay. Um, so why are they never seated? Well, their uh, priority is worse than the marginal priority, so no one in this group is going to be seated at school S. Um, the other group is the always seated group, okay? So that's theta, capital theta, super A sub S. Uh, this is the group whose priority at school S is uh, always better than the marginal priority group. Okay, so that's the top part of the previous table here, right? So these are the always seated group. If they apply to the school in the deferred acceptance algorithm, they would get in for sure because they have higher priority than the marginal priority group. Okay. Um, so everyone in this group is going to be seated at school, provided that they didn't get an, uh, an offer at a higher rank school. Okay. So everyone here is seated at school at when they are not seated at a school in the better than seven. Okay. Um, and then the last group. Here uh, are what we call the conditionally seated group. Okay, so that's the middle bar of the previous table, priority group two. Uh, these are the applicants who have marginal priority at school S. So members of this group are seated at school S when they don't get a better choice, when they're not seated at a school in B of theta S, and they clear the lottery uh, cutoff at school S. Okay, so um, but that's this priority group set right here. So not everyone in uh, the conditionally seated group is assigned a seat at school F, but these top two guys would, would be, right? Okay. All right, so, you know, my uh, co-author on this project is, is Angrist, right? So some of you may have heard of the late theorem, right? The famous kind of uh, Inman's Angrist paper, right? So there's the never takers, the always takers, and the compliers. So this is kind of where we're riffing on that a little bit. There are these three groups here, okay? Even though they're, they're totally different concepts. Um, okay, so that's uh, our three groups here. Now, uh, let me turn to the hardest kind of bit of notation in everything I'm going to talk about today, okay? And that is the most informative disqualification. Okay, so this is related to what I was trying to give you some intuition for before. We want to understand... Uh, the uh, nature of the truncation in the lottery numbers that occurs at the point at which you apply to school S. Okay? And the most informative disqualification is going to capture that uh, truncation for us. There's three different possible values, uh, three different cases for the um, most informative disqualification. Okay, so let me just go through each of these. So uh, the mid for an applicant at type of type theta at school S is zero, so there's no truncation, okay? If uh, your priority status is worse than marginal at all your higher rank schools. So if my school of interest is my fifth choice, and my first four choices are schools where I am sub-marginal, I have no shot of getting into, the fact that I got to apply to my fifth choice is not gonna be informative about my lottery number when I apply to my fifth choice, okay? So your mid is going to exactly uh, be zero in that case. So decoding the notation here, for every school S tilde that's better than school S, my priority is worse than the marginal priority at that school. Okay, so no truncation, kind of the easiest case. Second possible thing that could happen is what we call full truncation or complete truncation. So when would this happen? We would define the mid to be equal to one if my better than set includes a school where I am going to be seated uh, certain with certainty. Okay, so if the school is my fifth choice and my second choice is a school that I will get into no matter what, I'm always accepted, okay, uh, then I will be fully truncated when I think about my fifth choice. Okay, so these are kind of the two edge cases for the mid. The most intuitive case, and the reason why we call this the mid is actually the third case. 
So what's going on in the third case? Well, let's ignore this case here, right? And let's ignore this right here. We're going to be taking the cutoff, the lottery cutoff at the school S. That is the largest uh, cutoff for every school for which you're conditionally seated. Okay, so what's the exercise here? We look at all of the schools that you apply to above school S. Okay, so every S tilde that's in the better than set, that's in the ranked above school S. Restrict yourself to the schools above school S for which you're in the marginal priority group. Okay, and look for the largest cutoff. Why the largest cutoff? Well, that's the school that's the easiest to get into, right? That's what uh, the cutoff means. The larger value of the cutoff means uh, the school is easier to get into. It's less selective. And uh, I am going to just encode the uh, maximum of the lottery cutoffs of the of those schools, and basically disregard information about other schools uh, that are uh, not as easy to get into. So let me say this just in a very simple way, right? If I rank uh, um, Harvard and then UPenn and then uh, say University of Florida. Uh, if I'm looking at my risk of being assigned the University of Florida, the fact that I got rejected from Harvard is really irrelevant because I'd only apply to the University of Florida if I also got rejected from the University of Pennsylvania. Okay, so imagine the cutoff at Harvard is much more selective than the cutoff at UPenn. The information in the fact that I got rejected from UPenn dominates the information in the fact that I got rejected from Harvard. But the most informative disqualification for me is the school that's the least selective that I didn't get into. Okay, so that's what this notation here is capturing. We're taking the maximum cutoff of the schools that you ranked above um, uh, the school that we're interested in. Okay, that's where we're going to get some dimension reduction with the propensity score. Okay, continue. Okay, so uh, I know this is a very difficult slide notation wise. <laughs> Uh, for you, but uh, I hope that uh, kind of rough idea is uh, expressed here, right? So for anyone who's marginal or worse at schools that they prefer to school less, look for the most forgiving cutoff in the schools for which they're marginal that they've ranked above school S. Okay. Sorry, can I ask a question? Please, yeah. So maybe I'm slow here, but you know, uh, so the cutoff value low S, so doesn't it depend on the realization of the, the local number? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was so, how S is. So it's right. also a random number, right? How S. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. But my understanding is that you, know, you eventually want to have like you know some like you know the score which doesn't rely on the. Uh... Yeah. So we're gonna estimate this. Okay. Uh, uh -huh. By putting a hat. Uh, okay. On, reading it off our data uh -huh. set, and we have a theorem in the paper saying that's what we do. Okay. Yeah. And that is a thing. Yeah. Uh, this is just, I want to make sure. So there are infinitely many, like, you know, the continuum of the agents and we choose like and pick random numbers yeah. from there. So is it possible that we have actually the, the tie there or the, it's, can we yeah, say so, that the probability is zero? Uh, yeah, so we, we're basically kind of as, as usually done in economics, we're glossing over that, that issue. So we, we have a continuum of agents with random variables drawn from a continuum, right? So, um, we're, we're assuming this is okay, right? And, you know, there's some tricky measure theoretic issues. Okay, that okay. Mm -hmm. I think people much more technically talented than me. Yeah, yeah. It's, really, it's not that I can understand. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay, great, okay. Um, I, I think that if you know this literature, there's an ULIG paper that constructs the appropriate measure probability, prob probability I'm, I'm sorry, there's a Duffy and Sons paper is the one that allows us to do this fully mathematically correctly. Okay, I it. haven't seen okay. that. <laughs> I, you know, I was worried about this for a while and I talked to some colleagues and said, don't, don't worry about this stuff. <laughs> That's my get out of jail free card on this point. <laughs> okay, um, anyway. So, uh, okay, so uh, back to this, the narrative here. Okay, so we want this formula for the propensity score because I want to be able to compute this and deploy this. Okay, so um, uh, what's the formula? Okay, so I have a formula for the propensity score in the continuum economy, and it looks like the following. There's three cases. Okay, so let's just walk through these cases. Uh, the propensity score is zero if my type theta is in the never seeded group. Okay, there's no risk, there's no probability that a, uh, an applicant will be assigned to school S. Um, 
uh, you know, if they're in an average seated group. Okay. Propensity score is one minus the mid uh, if I'm in the always seated group. So what's going on here intuitively? In the algorithm, if I am allowed to apply to school S, I'm in the always seated group, so I will get in for sure. So what determines my risk of being assigned to school S? The only thing that determines my risk of being assigned to school S is a higher rank rejection. Okay. Uh, so what's going to tell me my uh, probability of having the opportunity to apply to school S? Well, it's simply going to be one minus my mid. Um, so uh, <clears throat> that's why we have uh, this second term here. Now, what's really interesting about this term for us was uh, I think many people, when they saw data sets generated by deferred acceptance, would look at a, a choice, say a given school, and say, that school had 50 seats and 25 kids were assigned that school. So there's no rationing happening at that school. There's no way I have a randomized experiment, right? Because if kid number 26 showed up and wanted to go to that school, they would get to go there for sure. Okay? And that's not correct. The reason that's not correct is some of the 25 kids who were assigned to that school could be assigned that school randomly by virtue of a higher ranked rejection. If the higher ranked rejection were done because their lottery number wasn't good enough, uh, they could be randomly assigned to a school that looks like it's undersubscribed um, when uh, the reason they're randomly assigned is their higher ranked choice randomly rejected them and gave them the opportunity to apply to the school S. Okay? Um, so that's going to be behind where we can actually get a lot more power by dealing with the algorithm, right? Um, so that's a, the second case. When you're always accepted, we still have some of those applicants subject to, to a rationing. Um, what about the, the third case? So the third case is breaking this into two pieces. This is why we read it this way. The first is the probability that you have the opportunity to apply to school uh, S. The second piece is saying, what's your probability of getting assigned school uh, S if you have the opportunity to, to apply to school S? So the reason why we have this ratio here is this is capturing the extent of truncation of your lottery number when you have the opportunity to apply to school S. Okay? Uh, so we're only dealing with this uh, support from one minus mid, and your probability is just going to be tau, the cutoff of the school S minus how much you've been truncated. Uh, and so this is what... Uh, the formula simplifies too. And um, now implementing this, so this is my formula for the continuum economy. Um, what we do in the paper is uh, we have sample analogs of this. So I just put hats on these. I can read this off of my data set for a given uh, realization of lottery numbers. And we show that, that our estimated uh, deferred acceptance propensity score converges to the continuum economy score. Uh, as the market size grows. Okay. Right, uh, yeah. So conceptually, what does the assumption continuity buy? Uh, Con continuity yeah. buy. So, so it allows us to cut off cutoffs, yeah. So cutoffs doesn't exist in case. Right? Or... The, the cutoffs will change with realizations of the economy. Oh, I see. So in a finite economy, I redraw lottery numbers, the cutoffs will move yeah. around. But can you define something like the MIB for finite? By a complicated formula, or well, possibly, possibly, possibly something like that might be simply doesn't exist. Um, for finite I, I think you could do it in a finite economy, uh, and it raises another question that we don't understand well. So, we've taken this particular continuum limit. There's other ways, actually. Fujito and I have another way of making kind of large markets random preference type oh, formulations. Oh, it, it seems like in those economies as well, the, the cutoffs don't move around very much if you have a large number of agents. So could you formulate a version of that uh, notion that was, would apply here as well? I don't know the answer to that. This is just really easy to work okay. compared to the other versions. Um, I mean, the, the, the main thing with the continuum, right, this, is that mid, tau, and, and the theta are, are population quantities, so it's not moving Across the draws, which um, you know, another question that we don't understand very well, even is if you go back to my simulation here, right? So I'm going all the way to the continuum to get uh, the type two and type three to converge. Okay, um, but if you look here, you know I don't have to take n to be infinity. This happens really fast, uh, and uh, so is that good enough, right? 
Uh, so in my data set, I said in Denver, we have uh, 4,300 types. Uh, is it reasonable to think of uh, n going to infinity in that actual problem? Maybe not, right? Again, it's kind of the usual asymptotic arguments in econometrics, right? We have one data point. What's the right asymptotic sequence? But there's something very robust about how quickly the cutoffs converge that I think is important for why this actually works in practice. Uh, yeah, um, another late person question. So, so in in this Rubin um, result that yeah. you quoted, yeah. so um, it was a conditional. So it it had a kind of this yeah the um it was a propensity score. So it depends on that the i. So is there some um result basically saying that if these values are very close, then you cannot see the data. I mean, they're close to the or you know, that, that value does not, that result does not exist, even though that, that's a fantastic question. Let, let me just rephrase that question because I, I think that's really a core thing for why this works well, okay? Um, so the um, rosenbaum rubin theorem, right, says, let's put this up here again, right? Uh, if I condition on the propensity score, right, then um, we have, uh, you know, we've controlled for omitted variables bias, right? So the question is, how important is it to get this exactly right? right? Now, I can cook up any finite, you know, example showing you that if it's not exactly right, it fails, right? I, I have the freedom to do that. If the propensity score is 0.9 for some applicants and 0.91 for a different set of applicants, I could show you things can go really haywire in theory. In practice, I don't think that's important. Uh, so uh, why is that uh, relevant? Well, um, I've taken a particular way of smoothing the score and the limit here. So how we've done that smoothing may not be that critical. And the fact that we've taken this continuum limit way to get to a particular value of the score may not be critical in practice. You know, another way for me to answer that question is in our empirical application, if I look at what happens when I run the lotteries into third acceptance a million times, and then take my propensity score values and bin them up into 0 0.001 cells, okay? And then say, you know, any propensity score value within 0 0.001 is the same. I get something very similar to this formula. Okay, and I think the underlying fact that's driving that is the extent of omitted variables bias in, in this problem that's driven by the propensity score is not so important that it's between 0 0.001 and the next value up, right? What, what I think is really critical for selection bias in these problems actually is that the score is degenerate, it's not degenerate, so that you face some risk. Uh, um, so what does that mean? I, and we've developed this idea in some other papers actually with, with Walters and, and Peter Hall. Um, I can do pretty well capturing selection bias in studies of school effects if I just condition on the fact that your propensity score is not zero or one, that you face some risk of a school of uh, being assigned to a school. Whether the risk is 0.5 or 0.7, in practice, okay, uh, this not in theory, this is not does not need to be true, but in practice, uh, it doesn't seem to be that consequential. Right? So said another way, if I use the exact values of the score versus just assume that. It's much coarser, I'll get a very similar answer. Right? Now, what I don't know how true that is across other settings where people use a propensity score, right? So uh, I, I think it's it's a very interesting set of questions that you're asking, though, uh, that we don't know very well. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, there was a there was a huge debate about this back in the 80s, actually, because one of the first uh uh you know uses of a propensity score was a debate that um uh, Bob Lalon wrote this paper in 1986 saying, can I replicate the evidence from uh, randomized studies of job training programs in the United States using uh, observational methods, using propensity score type methods, okay? And his conclusion was no. Okay, so uh, uh, at the time in 1986, you know, all the ways that economists had dealt, come up with to deal with selection bias corrections were inadequate to replicate what happened in lottery-based studies, okay? Uh, and since then, there has been this back and forth for 20 years about whether, in fact, Lalonde was right or not. Uh, so uh, I think a big part of that is some of the corrections that one would put in uh, um, are, you know, maybe uh, overcorrecting in some sense. Uh, so uh, 
this is all just to say, I don't want to get distracted by any misunderstanding what I'm saying. You're asking a very deep question, Guito, that I think is very, is very understudied. Yeah. Just how critical is it to get the exact value of the score correct or not? Um, okay, great. So let me, let me just press ahead here. Okay, so we got the DA score formula. Um, uh, just a couple of couple of comments here. So, um, you know, one of the things that we do in the paper, back to Michi's question, is why does that example two work? The reason example two works is because type two and type two share the same min. Works out, uh, and, and that's what uh, explains why the propensity score is converged to one another. Um, in okay, so let's try to turn now to some um, dividend from all this uh, tough notation. Okay, so. How do I put this to use and what, what can we learn? Okay, so um, um, how do I estimate the DA score? So I'm literally going to just do the analog principle, right? I'm going to take my theory and look in the data for the exact uh, match to the theory. So I look for theta S, theta uh, S A, A, and theta SC. Uh, I'll plug in tau S and the mids and uh, construct uh, phi of S, the, the DA propensity score. Uh, you can do another thing as well. So um, when you have small cells, let me just quickly show you this because this is another uh, underexplored issue with this. When I look at this group here, um, the group with marginal priority group two, uh, there's four, four applicants, right? And what I would uh, read off here is the cutoff is 0.35. Okay? Is that a good approximation of the probability that those four individuals got assigned a seat? Maybe not, right? Because there's four people, two of them get assigned to see. Maybe a half is a better approximation, right? But I'm going to be using one particular lottery realization. It turns out it's 0.35. Some folks uh, who work with propensity score estimation in other settings say it's better to look at the realized frequency of offer than uh, your lottery generation process here. A half would be better than 0.35 and, and estimating what that cutoff would be. Uh, so that's uh, what we call the frequency score. That's where we use the empirical offer rates within the cells defined by um, mm -hmm. the, the thetas and the mids. Okay. Um, it turns out, at least for Denver, this doesn't seem to matter very much, um, whether it's a formula or the frequency. Uh, we're also going to look at the finite market score just as a benchmark by doing this 1 million lottery draw simulation. Uh, and uh, as I've mentioned, we don't get the dimension reduction in the data. Uh, so we have to do some kind of smoothing. Uh, and maybe, maybe I, I like to see if I have to So this yeah. frequency method, so yeah. am I right that, that that method is photographic, you know, in the sense you don't have to use the DA based thing, but then this other one is actually DA based. Or yeah, and so you would still use DA to, to do to find those those cells. So you, you do this within the um, I'll uh, like, maybe if you do a lot of simulations, you could actually get the uh, uh, yeah, probably oh, also, yeah, that, that's right. So, uh, mm -hmm. if, what where if I do the frequency based method, right? If I go to like this table here, right? If you can tell me that there are these four guys on this table and uh, the um, offer rates are, you know, there's four people, two people get offered, then uh, I would get a, a half. So um, you could simulate the mechanism a million times and say, well, I know what the theta A's are, the theta C's, and the theta N's are, and then read off from that what the, the, the frequency is. That, that would be uh, a strategy one could use. You, you could even do something simpler, Fuita, which is just, I don't know anything about DA. They gave me this black box computer program. I know it uses lotteries. Uh, I'm going to rerun this a million times. So that's that's what this third thing here is. Oh, okay. So this is more of a you could say this is a little bit inside baseball. This is a more, more refined measure of uh, uh, assignment probability than the actual cutoff. Um, it's using the empirical frequency within the, the, the bin. Whereas this is just I don't care what it was. I have a randomized experiment. It's a black box. I'm just going to run it a million times. Uh, and as I mentioned, a lot there's at least three papers now that I see. Haven't bothered with this and just say, why don't we do this? Okay, but I will show you there is a dividend to uh, this, especially when we get to the non lottery case. Um, great. So, all right, so, um, um, okay, just one, one other comment, okay, just about this last point here. So, 
when when you look at the data in Denver, there's a very interesting school network um, that's called the Strive Academy. They run six different school campuses. And what we do in the paper is we actually break down where the assignment risk is coming from. Is it coming from case two? Back to the formula. Is it coming from case two or from case three? Okay. And going into this project, uh, I would have thought the vast majority of assignment risk is coming from case three, right? In the simplest case, you know, single lottery, that's case three, right? There's no truncation. Uh, you have uh, a lottery. If you're above the cutoff, you get an offer. Otherwise, you're below the cutoff. But at the Strive Green Valley Ranch campus and five other campuses, um, uh, most of the rationing is coming because of case two. It's coming because of a higher rank rejection, okay? Um, and so uh, what is really uh, uh, valuable about that is um, we have some calibrations in the paper saying, how much more data um, would you need uh, to get the same statistical precision gains uh, as using our method uh, compared to a strategy that just looked at whether a school was oversubscribed by their first choice? And so one way to kind of price the value of this method is it's as if you had four times more data than um, what previous approaches had done here, just looking at first choices. Okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, so what what's the um, research strategy now? Kind of the, the hard work is out of the way. Okay. So we have the propensity score. We have this randomized uh, control trial within these strata defined by the propensity score. So the last thing we need to do is uh, think about our question. So for Denver, uh, we're going to be focusing on what is the effect of attending a charter school. Denver is one of the first cities in the U.S. to have the autonomous charter schools and the traditional public schools under the same umbrella. Uh, if you apply, you can rank up to five choices. They use the deferred acceptance algorithm, a single tie breaking. And um, because I built everything up from a single school, and there are many charter schools, I need to define what the any charter uh, propensity score is. Okay, uh, what that's going to be is simply the sum of the propensity scores for uh, each charter school that you've ranked. So I get to rank five choices. Let's say three of my five choices are charter schools. I would compute your propensity score for the first of those, the second of those, and the third of those, uh, and sum them up. Um, because this is a single offer system, I can uh, sum them up. Um, my uh, empirical strategy will define a, a any charter school offer dummy variable di, which is just the sum of individual charter school offers. So in my data set, you get an offer at one school. So this is, did you get an offer at uh, a charter school, any charter school that you let, let ranked? Um, and then finally, my endogenous variable here, ci, is did you enroll in the charter school? Okay. Um, so the way we're going to implement this is a, a simple two stage least square system. So our first stage relates charter enrollment CI to uh, getting a random offer at a charter school. And we have these score controls here. So that's what that first uh, bit of notation is. Okay. Uh, the second uh, stage is going to relate the outcome, our standardized test scores here, uh, to our enrollment. Uh, uh, yeah. What does a charter offer mean in terms of DA? Uh, so we would look at your rank order list and say, um, did you get an offer at one of the schools on your rank order list that is a charter school? So yeah, oh, oh, honey, the match. Yeah, a match. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so a, a match generated by the algorithm. Okay. Right. So stuff happens after that mm -hmm. we're not we're ignoring that right so it has to be algorithmically generated in a way that we control the theta mm -hmm. anything beyond that is potentially confounded by you know um the choices that people have made yeah. Yeah. so you mentioned that the Denver only allows for five to yeah. to the media yeah. so it's not the same but my impression is that what you told me actually okay, is okay totally it's totally fine yeah so the reason it's fine is our kind of perspective to start here is I have some theta goes through some process that generates offers. I'm not taking any interpretation of what that theta is. As soon as I want to ask a question related to what that theta is, like a natural question, with what would happen if we created 10 more charter schools? Then I'd have to take a stance on where does theta come from, right? But for what I'm doing today, I'm not doing that right now. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank Okay, so you know, just again recap. This is kind of the instrumental variable setup that we have here, as simple as can be, right? So, 
uh, uh, first stage offer to um, enrollment, second stage enrollment to, to outcome. Okay, um, and you know I'm going to be reporting a weighted average across values at the propensity score. Okay, the particular weighting is given by the uh, controls here. Um, all right, so let's see uh, some facts on the data. So uh, one question I already hinted at this. Okay, so uh, what is the value of this method over kind of pre-existing approaches to this question? So uh, here uh, I plotted all of the schools in Denver. Each point here corresponds to a school, and my x-axis is the capacity of the school. Right, how many seats are offered, and this is on the log scale. Okay, so there's some very small schools, but um, many large schools. Um, the black dot refers to the number of applicants who are subject to randomization if we only looked at your first choice. And this is kind of how people used to do this prior to this work. They would say, there's a school that has 100 seats and 150 people applied, so there must be a lottery there. There must have been some rationing, so let's try to study that at school. Uh, the red line are the additional number of applicants subject to randomization um, when we look at all of the choices. Okay. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, for most of these, these ones are flat, that's why <laughs> these are a B, but for most of these, we see a huge increase in uh, the sample size that we get to study, okay? Um, and so this is for all of the schools that are not charter schools. So if you're interested in a different question, what's the effect of uh, um, getting assigned you know, any of these non-charter schools, you get a lot more data, okay? Um, what about uh, the estimates here? So um the way to read this okay this is kind of the main table uh, of the paper um uh if we focus on the frequency propensity score column one this is showing the effect of uh, enrolling in denver's charter schools on math and i'm reporting the math scores here these are a standardized test score that everyone in colorado has to take um that's a um standardized unit so for just some context in america um one way people think about test scores is through the black-white achievement gap in the United States. That's about 0.8 standard deviations. So, um, you know, I would say prior to the work that uh, we've been doing on charter schools, we've never found any educational intervention that improved test scores uh, by more than 0.2 standard deviations. Okay, uh, the charter results are just kind of off the charts on test scores. So if you uh, win a seat randomly to uh, go to one of Denver's charter schools, your math scores go up by about half a standard deviation. Okay, that's a kind of gigantic estimate in the in the grand scheme of things. Um, uh, for reading and writing, the effects are smaller, uh, though they're still quite large. Um, column one is the frequency method. The formula method is column um, three. Um, if I compare that to the simulation-based uh, approach, we see something pretty similar from doing just a simulation and. Spinning things up at the hundreds. Uh, so that's the, the message here. Um, I'll skip a semi parametric here. So that's if you don't like the linear system, we can be more flexible, but uh, that comes at the cost of some standard errors. Um, here's um, uh, what I was mentioning a second ago about why bother with all this complexity, right? What did we actually learn? Uh, that's better than what you would have uh, thought before. Um, I want to just focus on. Uh, column four and column five. So what we do here is we say, take our method, look at the uh, uh, standard error, how precise your estimates are. How would that compare to a, a method that had been used in the past, uh, which is either looking at your first choice or looking at whether you qualified for the school. So did you just clear the cutoff? Um, and what you see is um, our method for math is as if you had four times more data relative to the qualification strategy or twice as much data. Uh, if you had um, uh, just the first choice strategy. Um, so let me just see how we're doing here. Um, so let me use my last 10 minutes then uh, to, to turn to just another application of this, okay? So, so you have the kind of the basic idea, right? We have DA, there's some lottery-based rationing. We fully exploited all the lottery-based rationing. In the context of Denver's uh, uh, charter school sector, the results are so large that we would conclude these are quite effective schools, uh, but we could say that with much more precision by um, using our the, the other approaches. In other settings, uh, the situation is a little bit more uh, mixed. 
Uh, we wish we had the ability to say things with a lot of precision, uh, but, but we don't. So having the, the details of this uh, procedure uh, not uh, locked down is going to be quite important. And so let me now turn to an example of that. So this is from a paper that um, came up uh, about two years ago looking at universal preschool. Okay, so um, uh, let me set the stage a little bit in the United States uh, about preschool. So uh, many economists uh, and social scientists more generally look at early childhood programs as a promising tool to improve outcomes and address socioeconomic disparities. Okay. Um, and that comes from several uh, different motivations. One is uh, there is evidence that early life deficits generate persistent negative impacts. Okay, so um, uh, that's a work that Doug Allman and others have uh, put together. Uh, second uh, motivation for interest in early childhood programs is uh, a set of papers that I think are most commonly associated with Jim Heckman, um, estimating very high rates of returns to historical early childhood interventions. Um, so in uh, part, uh, because of uh, this motivation uh, in the United States right now, there are large efforts on, on expanding public preschool. So I would say it's in the education reform debate in the United States, you know, 15 years ago, there were large efforts to expand charter schools. And, you know, that was where we had a lot of cities adopting unified enrollment deferred acceptance system. The place where there's a lot of excitement about enro enrollment reform in the US right now is with preschool. So why not expand access to preschool? Why not use centralized algorithms for preschool? Um, if you go to the uh, uh, subway station in right outside my office in MIT, there's a very big sign that says, Cambridge is offering universal preschool, apply online using our match. Okay, so they have a centralized algorithm used for, for pre preschool. And, you know, a little bit the political pendulum, charter schools are a topic that uh, folks who are more conservative on the right like, public preschool is a topic that folks on the left uh, who are uh, more progressive are, are uh, fine. And so preschool reform efforts are uh, a big part of uh, the initiatives of the current White House in the United States. Um, and a lot of innovation is happening at the state and local level, okay? Now, what do we know about preschool? So I'm kind of a new entrant to this space. I never thought of myself as ever writing a paper about preschool, but because we have this method and because we have this data from Boston, we have the opportunity to write this paper. Uh, and what was really eye-opening to me is how little we actually know about preschool, okay? So, uh, uh, my summary of the literature on preschool is that uh, we have um, randomized evaluations of small scale model demonstration programs in the 1960s and 70s. Okay, so the most famous of these is what's called the Perry Preschool Project. Uh, this may be one of the most influential social experiments of all time. They took um, uh, African American children of single mothers in um, Ypsilanti, Michigan, and uh, had them. Um, uh, randomly assigned to get uh, access to uh, uh, Perry Preschool, um, and uh, it's, I think, 123 kids. There's a joke among early childhood researchers that there are more than 123 studies of these 123 kids. Okay, so this study, the Perry Preschool Project, this is what Jim Heckman has spent a lot of time studying, uh, has been quite influential because the uh, follow-up rate and coverage of these kids is, is quite uh, remarkable. They are now have papers about the offspring, this the intergenerational effects of the Perry preschool. Um, uh, and so what you know we find from Perry and a kind of sister project called the ABC Darien project is that there are large impacts on short run test scores, behavior, and long-term economic outcomes. So this is why uh, um, Heckman and others have said there are very large rates of return to early childhood interventions looking at Perry um, from some kids. Uh, aside from that, we have um, studies of the Head Start program. So this is a federal program in the United States. Uh, these are uh, not um, experimental studies. So uh, some are based on within sibling comparisons. Others are based on uh, discontinuities and program rules. And what this literature tends to find is uh, that you have test score effects early on for kids who are, say, seven or eight. By the time you get to third grade, so when you're, say, nine, nine years old, the effects are, no longer exist. And then uh, if we track some of these kids till their early 20s, we find uh, some long-term effects uh, of Head Start. 
And because of this, many people have speculated that there is some non-cognitive channel of education, something that the education process is doing that is not being picked up by the standard assessments, okay, test score assessments. Uh, and then finally, and this is where we, we fit in, um, there are three randomized studies of large-scale programs uh, in the United States. So one is the Head Start Impact Study. That was a randomized study of Head Start that the federal government put forward uh, about 20 years ago. Um, sadly, they only tracked the kids to third grade in that study. Um, Second is uh, the Tennessee Voluntary Pre-K Program. Um, so that's a, a, a study that kind of overlaps with a bit of what we're doing. Um, and um, what uh, both of these studies have shown is that if you track kids till they're uh, 10 or 11, uh, we see initially promising effects of uh, sending them to school when they're four years old. But by the time they get to uh, be in fifth or sixth grade, those effects are, are gone and there's even hints of negative effects. It's a bit of a mystery. Why are we so gung ho about preschool? Given the modern era, randomized evaluations are showing a pretty mixed uh, picture. These early studies are from a totally different era uh, in a totally different context. Um, um, and so, uh, what we do in this project, right, um, uh, is uh, we try to fill in the gap uh, with a randomized design using the assignment law mechanism where we have long-term outcomes um, and we have a large-scale program. Uh, this is a program that the city of Boston um, offered. Okay, so uh, unlike these last two studies that I showed you, the Head Start Impact Study and the Tennessee Long-Term Preschool Program, uh, where they only track kids till um, basically sixth grade uh, for Tennessee and third grade for Head Start, uh, we're able to track kids all the way into college. Okay, um, and um, that's uh, uh, the topic of this paper, okay? So uh, I'll just tell you very quickly, okay? So what's kind of uh, nice about this project, right? Is once you have the market design meets research design machinery, this was the easiest paper uh, that I've ever written, okay? Because uh, you just take that machinery, you have your experiment. Uh, we're using data from Boston Public Schools. Uh, they were using a centralized mechanism uh, during this time period. Now, actually, to Felito's question, in this time period, they're using the Boston mechanism, okay? Uh, the only reason I had access to these files is because when we were students, <laughs> uh, Boston allowed me to work with these data files, right? But fortunately, these kids are now in their mid-20s, okay? So we can track what happened to these kids. Um, so we adjust the methodology that we've been talking about uh, for the Boston mechanism, which is a very modest tweak, and we linked these applicants to uh, behavior on college going, okay? Uh, so that's the key outcome that we have, college attendance and college type. Uh, but since uh, we have these kids in the administrative data records in Massachusetts, we can see all the medium run impacts of test scores and grade progression and disciplinary outcomes, okay? And so I know I'm almost out of time, so let me just jump to kind of the, the bottom line uh, here, okay? Uh, and that's kind of shown in this table, okay? So same kind of setup as uh, the Denver study I just showed you. We have uh, kids subject to risk. I compute the DA propensity score uh, appropriately and modified for the algorithm that's used during these years. And I'm looking at the effect of um, uh, randomly winning a seat to preschool on whether you in, uh, attend college on time in Boston. Okay, so for the kids who... Uh, did not get an offer at preschool, only about 46% of them attend college. Okay, so it's a very disadvantaged population. Um, for those who uh, um, uh, uh, win a seat, the effect of uh, going to preschool is to increase their college going by 8.3 percentage points. Okay, so, um, so you, uh, <clears throat> you know, pretty large effect, I would say, for a pretty disadvantaged population. Uh, the rest of the paper, uh, if you're interested, it's a pretty very simple paper looks for uh, a bunch of short run and medium run effects. Do we see effects on test score? Do we uh, see effects on grade progression, credits that you uh, earn? The only thing that we find uh, a very consistent pattern for is uh, effects on discipline and behavioral uh, incidents. If you got to go to preschool when you're four years old, you're much less likely to get in trouble, okay? And that's concentrated in boys, okay? Um, 
there's no evidence that you're scoring higher on standardized tests. There's no evidence that you're more likely to uh, say take an AP test or advanced tests. Um, so uh, there may be something to this sleeper effect uh, hypothesis uh, that I hinted at, right? Just to summarize here, uh, this is the first experimental evaluation of a large scale preschool program with long-term outcomes. And there's a uh, pretty encouraging evidence on college going um, and this non-cognitive index, these behavioral outcomes, uh, but there's no evidence of um, uh, effects on MCAS scores, that's a standardized test score. So, you know, we were excited about this study because it shows possibilities for large-scale public preschool. We're not necessarily uh, going to rest our laurels on these model programs in the 60s and 70s, uh, and uh, these findings um, got a lot of attention. Um, so, as the White House was rolling out preschool in the United States, they were thrilled to see this study come out and say, look at why we should have more preschool. Um, I think they had already decided to support preschool before our work. So uh, as usual, the uh, politicians select the studies that support what they are, had already decided to do. Uh, but, you know, more substantively, I think one of the things that I've started to think a little bit more carefully about is, you know, a lot of the studies of education effects are focused on um, short run or medium run test scores. And if we had looked at the short run and median run test scores in Boston study, uh, we would say preschool is not very effective. Okay, and that seems to be what people have said about Tennessee and the Head Start Impact study. I think the, uh, uh, it's very important to keep tracking of these kids because the education process is much more complicated than what's picked up on some of these standardized assessments. Okay. Well, let me stop there, uh, one minute over time, and I will pick up on Monday on the non lottery case and we'll turn to some policy questions about affirmative action. Okay, so that's a very exciting topic from the market design perspective and also the policies perspective in the United States. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you very much.